Hello, hello. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. We are four o'clock on the dot. Right now we've got almost 30 people. That's awesome. Um, yeah, let's give a hand of a shot. Now in person, we have two people. So definitely big shout out to our two physics students that have came in person to see some cool physics demos. Um, so I am Don Balanzat with the uh, physics instructional resource team and uh, our team wanted to put on a little end of the year demo show for you guys. Um, uh, and I see a mix of students, professors, admin from the department. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I think we've got a pretty good show for you today. Again, we, we are not a, a production crew, although we have tried our best to learn these skills over the past uh, few months. Um, as we all learn to adjust to the situation that we live in now. Um, but yeah, like uh, we're, we're, we're gonna show you some very cool stuff today. Like I said, I'm Don Balanzat. This is Steve Renander, also part of the physics instructional resource team. This is Danielle, one of our student workers, a current sophomore in, in the physics department. And we are actually doing a remote, remote show. So we've got Steve Shapiro in the other room. Uh, he's part of the physics instructional resource team as well. And he has joined in there by Chris, another one of our student workers, I believe also a sophomore. Um, and so, yeah, there he is. <laughs> We've got our awesome student workers, which is, uh, it's, it's not possible without them. So let's give it up for them. Yeah. Um, so to start things off, I wanna just talk about what physics is, right? It's, it's this grand study of how matter operates within our universe. It's how it moves, it's how it, takes energy from one form to another. Um, and there's many different ways that we can explore this concept. Uh, and that's essentially what we're going to do throughout this show. We're going to start off with Steve Renander here. He's gonna talk about uh, some classical mechanics, which is the very first thing that we teach in the physics department or in general. And um, Steve, please take it away. Oh, wait, oh, we can't hear you, Steve. You are muted. So I will start here. So it's an honor that I get to present one of the classic physics demos, the monkey hunter. Now, the story behind the demo is part of the whole demonstration. And in fact, I've been told that the story is pushing 100 years old and it varies from place to place. So my version might vary from other versions, but the monkey hunter is kind of an odd story. It's kind of weird, but the more you think about it, like physics, it makes a little more sense. And it's a way of tying together projectile motion and free fall. And the idea or the basis of this story is up in a tree, you have a monkey hanging there from a branch, high up in the tree, up in the canopy of the forest and down on the ground, you have the hunter with the gun. And for some reason, he wants to bag himself or shoot a monkey. And he does, he spots the monkey way up in the tree, takes aim. Unfortunately, right when he's taking aim, the monkey hanging on with one hand starts waving at him. And it's like, uh oh, something's up. And so the hunter realizes that as soon as he pulls that trigger, the monkey going to let go. So here we get this classic problem and we've given an ASU twist. So if we can see up top here, our monkey is actually Wilbur the Wildcat. And he's way up top there and he is anchored by an electromagnet. And so the electromagnet is wired into our trigger. And here is our hunter. Now the hunter in this case, it's a little more advanced. Well, first off, it's air powered pneumatic. It shoots a dart. So we're gonna actually try to hit Wilbur. It is here dart. And it's also laser sighted. Now that's where the hunter came into problems with this initial situation. It's like, does he aim 
at the monkey? Does he aim below the monkey? Or does he aim above the monkey? So three basic choices there. And we're gonna see if we can kind of identify the best choice. So well, basically, I'll give you a little clue. The time that it takes for this dart to be fired and hit the monkey over here is gonna be the same as the time it takes for the monkey, or in this case, Wilbur, to drop. It's a good clue. The other one I have to say is gravity. The non-discriminate force of nature. Acts the same on pretty much everything here on Earth. We have the same acceleration. And so I'm gonna choose to aim right at Wilbur. Put him in the hat. So I'll load this guy up. Now remember, this is a live demo. And so we'll jump going here. And if we have a three, two, one, fire. Oh, <laughs> all right. Good shooting there, Tech. So the classic monkey hunter. And yeah, aim right at the monkey. <laughs> Bullseye. Now, my second demo, which I have to say, initially I was like, oh, this is really cool. And then I realized, oh, what did I sign up for? <laughs> Here's the wrecking ball. Now, there's a couple of things I wanted to point out here. He's a little bit off the floor, but you can see we have a nice little cinder block there. And if you remember, when things are moving, they have some kinetic energy. Now, we'll pull it back a little bit and we'll give it some potential energy based on position. So potential becomes kinetic. Now, let's see if we can smash this. Thing. A little bit of aiming here. Oh. So we do have a fair amount of energy. Now, here's the part that I usually have trouble with. My brain really understands physics, but my nose and my toes, they tend to tend to, they argue with my brain a little bit. So let's see if I can stay in place here. So all potential, and then remember, it's gonna to convert to kinetic back to potential, and hopefully it'll all be potential up here. Oof. <laughs> Let's do that one more time, except we're gonna get the close up oh, so that yeah. we can really see Should have a head how up. close that gets to your face. <laughs> <laughs> All I right. Started sweating there. Now, as far as moving from energy from one place to the other, we're going to focus on using the spring. Okay. And so I have a couple partners here. They're going to help me out with this. Okay. So let's take these cinder blocks out of the way. Yeah. So waves tend to be a common energy mover. And to demonstrate some wave behavior, in physics classes, we tend to nice. use the long, skinny spring. Sorry about my mask here. I'm doing a lot of talking. And this will require some experts, some people with rhythm. Now, one of the first things we're going to do with the spring is something very basic down here on the ground here. Hopefully, everybody, we're just going to send a singular pulse. And so Don just sends a singular pulse on the wave. And you can see it's reflected, and it's reflected backwards. Now, that's one nice wave behavior, reflection. And then also the waves can interact. So let's just see some interference. And you can go, let's go constructive if you can okay, go. So both this way. Ready? Three, two, one. And you notice it kind of passes through, but gets bigger in the middle. So let's do that one more time. Three, two, one. All right, but really, when we have a spring like this, waves also like to resonate. 
And we know that we can have some really basic waveforms. And at the nodes, we usually have, at the ends, we usually have nodes, no movement taking place. And the middle, in this case, we'll have at least one anti node. Now, let's see if we can get an anti node or one singular wave. Cool. And so we'll have Danielle be the fixed end and I'll do, do be the driving frequency. So. so here we get one singular pulse, the fundamental frequency. N equals one. And at the end, we should have each a node and in the middle an anti node. Now, Don has to kind of generate the wave there so he doesn't get a good. But once we take it up to the next level here, and this is where harmonics come into play. Here we get a node in the middle. He's barely moving. Nodes at each end and two anti nodes. And his requires the second harmonic. Now let's see what you guys do. Can you try three? Oh, and you can see that once they get it kind of dialed in there, there's that resonant frequency and the spring we're just is attracted to that frequency. It just really works well there. Let's see if they got what they got in them. Four. That's it. Oh, there we go. Right. Those, oh. <laughs> oh, we're back to it. Yeah, that's four. There we go. There we go. And you notice we have four anti nodes. Oh, she's like. <laughs> Oh, there they, they're starting to rip. And we have a beautiful standing wave there, too. Do you think, can we go for five? <laughs> so I'll have Danielle try. Let's see. All right. Oh, yes. Got it. <laughs> oh, these guys did a good so job. So I'll, I'll try for five as, as well here. So. Oh, look at those standing waves there. And then the clear nodes between each one of the anti nodes there. Whew. All I right. have to give these guys a hand. <laughs> they did great. Okay, so you can take that. So now we're going to take this waveform, or Don's going to take this waveform idea a little bit farther. So there's this idea of resonance that, uh, that you were talking about. It's this frequency that, and I don't like to personify science all the time, but it's something that uh, an object has a tendency to vibrate at. It likes to vibrate at it. And so when, I, when we generated just the right frequencies with the spring, we got those nice standing waveforms, these resonant waveforms. And so this is, actually, this is actually a property of a lot of different kinds of materials and objects in the universe. And so one example could be, for example, this bowl right here. And I'm gonna switch the camera, or I'm gonna zoom in on this a little bit. What I have here, it's called a Tibetan singing bowl. And uh, Tibetan monks would use this to guide their meditations because it made a very nice sound. Perhaps you can hear the sound when I vibrate it at just the right frequency. Is this coming through? Any indication from the chat? Yes, you can hear it, all right. And so this is the frequency, this is that waveform that will always be produced by this bowl. It's the frequency that it likes to resonate at. And so uh, you might notice there's some action going on in the water here. Um, and I actually can turn on this document camera so we can get a closer look at exactly what that looks like. So right here, all I'm doing is putting my hands in the water to get the right amount of friction to create the vibration that this bowl likes. And so I'm gonna go again. And I'm barely putting any pressure on it because you really have to be fine tuned about how you get that frequency. And you can see there's places where a lot of action is going on and there's places where there's not so much like in, on, the, on the legs here. And so you can, kind of play around with this idea with a variety of different things in a variety of different ways. So I'm gonna reset the camera here. And we will move on to one of my favorite demonstrations that I have the pleasure to work with called the Rubens tube. And so 
what this is. It's a way to visualize sound waves. And a sound wave is essentially that back and forth motion of something uh, creating a pressure difference in the air and that pressure difference propagates and it can be picked up by our ears or it can be transferred to other materials. In this case, we have a column of air inside here, inside this aluminum tube. And there's maybe 130 holes in this tube. And on one side, I have a speaker, which I've connected all sorts of uh, nice musical goodies that we're gonna analyze. And the speaker will drive the air back and forth inside this tube. And it will, much like when we uh, had this, the spring go back and forth and send that wave, sends that wave pulls down the spring, it'll send it down this tube and it will reflect off this solid end. And at certain points, much like the spring, we should see resonant frequencies. And so th the way to actually see this is that I've got some propane and this propane will, let me turn it on here. It will send it into this tube and accordingly out of each of these tiny holes. Oh yeah, it smells like propane for sure. <laughs> and so when I light this up, we've got all of these nice jets of uh, propane fire. I'm gonna lower it just a little bit. We wanna be safe with fire. And so when I send these sound waves through the speaker, we will see the differences in pressure in the differences in the height of the flame. That, make, that kind of makes sense uh, with the, along with this conservation of energy principle and, and uh, nodes and anti-nodes, right? And so what I'm gonna do is adjust the frequency. I'm gonna start low. And remember, when we had the lower frequency, we were providing less energy and we had that large, large waveform. If you remember when we were using the spring, it was just going back and forth real slow. And as we added more and found more resonant frequencies, it was going faster. Um, so I've got 39 Hertz here. Let me make sure all my inputs are correct, doing our due diligence here. And so, Okay, so we're at 239. Can we see that on the screen? Okay, nothing very pretty just yet. So I'm gonna sweep up through the frequencies. Ah, this is a pretty good one. You see these places of high action or right here and low action right here. And it kind of goes back and forth exactly like the spring did. And Maybe we need a little more propane here, yeah. If you remember, as we increase the frequency, and I'm, I've got a frequency generator, the times per second that it's vibrating back and forth, I can we find a good one. Oh, it's being finicky today. One second. It should be noted that a scientist doesn't always do it right on the first try. Let's just remember. You're accepting it here. Here we go. This is good. So you can see as I as I've swept higher, this is now six times what it was before. You can see there's a lot more waves, or a lot more uh, nodes and anti nodes. Oh. And so these are standing waves, and this is a very simple thing. A lot of the sounds that we hear are not simple standing waves though. So we can actually, for example, look at certain kinds of music, something that tends to resonate, pun intended, with this uh, very well is flute music. And it's, it kind of makes sense because a flute is also just a column of air, much like this is a column of air. And so the waveforms that it will like to produce will probably work well with this. And we found, um, this is a piece called uh, Shaman's Call, Carlos Nakai, his album Earth Spirit. It's a really nice pan flute 
uh, piece, and I'm gonna make sure the connections are all good here. This is to two, all right. I'm gonna play it. I always love watching that. And so the last thing I wanna show, again, that was a really nice waveform because it is just a nice cylindrical pipe. We get this nice, uh, really uh, solid waveforms. But I'm gonna do one last thing here. I'm gonna speak into it. And you can see my voice visualized in the fire. And you can see that it's probably not that, uh, I don't wanna say it's not nice to hear, I don't wanna be self-deprecating, but it will probably not have really nice sinusoidal waveforms like that. And so go here, turn this up. Maybe this will work, hello, hello, hello. This is mic one, mic check, mic check. Mic check, mic check, hello. Oh no, we are indeed having technical difficulties, but they have been resolved, look at that. We can now see my voice in the fire. And uh, I think that's pretty cool. I think this is something that you can actually build at home. This is, just, again, this is just a column of aluminum with some holes popped into it, and you're feeding some propane into it. It's really nice. Um, and I, I guess I can try and uh, match a note here. Let's do this. I, I, I didn't plan on doing this, but we're all about experimentation here in the physics department. So I will turn on our nice frequency generator. And we had it somewhere around 600, right? Where we had a good waveform. Uh, uh, okay, let's try that, shall we? You saw that was a really nice waveform, right? <laughs> let's see, what mine is, uh, right? That's, that was the note. Uh, All right, I don't think that's that bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so this is just the basics of sound, something that we go over extensively in physics. Um, but do you know what else we go extensively into in physics is electricity and magnetism, because one of the great things in physics is the electromagnetic wave. But before you can understand that wave, much like these sound waves, you must understand the basics of electricity. So we're going to pass it over to our remote Steven Shapiro. So can you go, before I start, can everyone hear me? Let's see in the chat. Chris, let me know, can they hear me? Awesome. No, not yet? Okay, cool. So everyone can hear me. Perfect. So as I begin, Don has mentioned that we, that there are other types of waves other than sound. There are electromagnetic waves. But before we can get into electromagnetic waves, we have to kind of break down what does that mean? Now, some of you guys who are physics one students, you learned up to this point. You've learned sound, you've learned all this stuff, but you haven't actually gotten into electricity and magnetism. So I'm gonna begin by talking about the branch of physics that we call electrostatics. You may have heard the term el static electricity before. That's the study of slow or non-moving charges. Now, a way that we can mess around with static electricity, some of you guys may have done this at home, is you rub your feet on the floor and you go and touch something metal. Well, you get that little shock or you go maybe touch your little brother or sister. Maybe you rub a balloon on your head and you stick it to a wall. That's all playing around with electrostatics or again, slow or non-moving charges. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that water is actually uh, conducted. Now, overall, it's neutral. Two oxygens, one, or sorry, two hydrogens, one oxygen and even though overall it has no net charge, because of the separation of hydrogen, which is slightly more positive, and oxygen, which is slightly more negative, we actually get what's called a dipole, or a little bit of separation of charge in the individual molecule. 
So what we can actually see is that I could take, this is just a PVC pipe and just a piece of fur, and I could charge it up by rubbing. Now, this is the same thing, just like rubbing a balloon on your head, or again, rubbing your feet on some carpet. And if we let water come out, I just have a funnel here with some green water coming through. Let's get that water moving. There we go. What we can actually see is that if we charge up a rod, we can actually mess around with the electrostatic properties of water. And you can actually cause it to bend. It's true, water bending. Let's charge this up a little bit more and we can go the opposite way. What's happening here is that the charge separates of that water molecule. See, we actually got it lifting a little bit out of the sink. The separation of charge in that water molecule is actually attracting the charge that I'm building up in the PVC pipe. Now you can do this with other types of materials, stuff like silk, stuff like vinyl, and you can actually sometimes see repulsion instead of attraction. So this is pretty cool. You know, water, you can actually do this stuff at home. Again, just any sort of a charge tube. You can even potentially do this with a balloon if you have a fine enough stream. And you can pull that, uh, that charge to you. So this is something fun, and again, something you can do at home. Now I'm gonna stop our water right here. We're gonna switch our camera shot here to, a, to our little room shot. Switch it for me, Chris, awesome. There it goes. I don't know why it kind of spins when it does that. Hopefully it didn't make any of you guys or any of you guys dizzy. Now what we have here is what's called a Van de Graaff generator. People often see these and they go, oh, it's a Tesla coil. Not quite the same thing. You see what's going on in here is the exact same thing that happened when we charged up the rod. I used fur and, a P and I rubbed it on the PVC tube. Well, in this, we have this silk band on the inside. And inside of this big metal disc, or this big metal sphere, there are these little fingers. And as the silk moves past it, it builds up charge within this metal, within this metal tube. Now, what happens when you rub a balloon on your head too much? Well, your hair stands up, right? It start, the actual hair fibers begin to repel one another and stand up. Well, we can actually see this same effect using our Van de Graaff. So as we build up charge, watch what happens. Well, it becomes a party. You start seeing this pom-pom and all of the hair on it stands up. Well, what's going on here? You see, we're actually building up a whole bunch of like charge within this metal sphere. So let's just say a whole bunch of positive charges. Now, as they build up, well, like charges attract, or like, sorry, like charges repel one another. So as we build up a bunch of positive charge in one hair, it's going to repel the hair below it. And the same would be if these were negative. A whole bunch of negative charge building up in one hair is going to repel the other negative charge. Now, these are gonna keep repelling one another. And you'd actually notice if I turn this off, if I turn this off, they stay up for a little, but what's going on right here? What's this thing doing? This thing is actually stealing some of the charge from it. Stay on my camera shot for a bit. This thing is actually stealing some of the charge. So these are all repelling until that charge needs to go somewhere. Well, where does that charge go? It ends up leaving as a shock. If I go and touch this, it grounded. What happened is all the charge that had built up here in the sphere now jumped to my arm. Now, if I take off the hair, we can do another experiment dealing with the same properties. All these are right here are some pie tins. Now, these are just like what you'd cook at home. Whoop, okay, one less. These are just like what you'd cook with at home. Now, if I place all of these on top of my Van de Graaff, I want you guys at home to think here. And I'm gonna give you a couple seconds to think before I turn it on. I've asked this question several times before, done this experiment quite a bit. I get a whole bunch of different responses. Will now, as I build up like charge in the sphere, some people think, okay, these are gonna go levitate on top of one another. Some people think they're all just going to explode off. Well, what happens? Let's see. As we turn this on, it builds up charge and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Notice what happened. They didn't all explode off. They didn't levitate. They actually came off one at a time. What was going on here is that as we had all of these stacked pythons, and as we built up charge in the outside of this Van de Graaff, well, they were all getting a whole bunch of like charge building up. And ultimately, there was so much like charge in the second or penultimate python compared to the top python that it was strong enough to actually lift it off, 
create a little bit of imbalance, and therefore it fell off. Once that happened, we built up charge in the next pi tin. Again, a little bit of charge built up, and it came off. So on and so forth until all of our pi tins came, until all of our pi tins fell off. Now, the Van de Graaff isn't just used for basic electrostatic demos like this. You often see these, they're called little lightning machines. Why? Because the buildup of charge is actually the exact same way that lightning works and that we see happen in clouds. As clouds move past one another on a stormy night or a stormy day, they actually, the molecules in them rub against one another and charge gets built up. Well, once enough charge builds up in a cloud, the charge ultimately has to go somewhere. And where is it gonna go? Well, it's going to be attracted to the nearest ground it can find. The near, let's say it builds up a bunch of positive charge, it's going to jump to the ultimate negative it can find. Well, usually that is the floor. We call that the ground. So the charge jumps it all the way to the ground. Now this follows what's called Coulomb's law. You see, it needs more charge in order to go a further distance. And it, it, it creates more force and less force when it's further away. So when the clouds are really high up in the sky, it takes a lot more charge buildup for that bolt of lightning to hit the ground. Now you've probably heard before, you don't wanna be standing alone in an open field during a lightning storm. Well, why is that? That's because the charge is going to try to take the easiest route possible. It's gonna to try to go the smallest distance it can to get to the ground. Well, charge just like us is lazy. It doesn't want to go long path. So if you're alone, even though you may only be six feet taller than the ground, it would rather go through you to get to the ground as opposed to just striking the, the ground near you. Now, if there's something else conductive around it, well, that charge is gonna to wanna to go that way instead. Like if it'll rather go toward water, which would conduct it or go toward easier objects. Now humans are conductive just like the ground, just like uh, water. So what we see is that if I, you know, risking myself here for science. If I bring my arm close to this Van de Graaff, I'll get shocked a few times. Hopefully you guys can see them. I'll keep going. Notice how my arm is twitching here. Now I've done this for a while. This isn't out of fear. This isn't out of anything. Oh, I'm kind of afraid of it. Your nerves and your muscles in your body are electrical. So every time this bolt strikes my arm, Hopefully you guys can see some of those. Let's try to move my arm maybe here. Every time this bolt strikes my arm, you see a twitch. What's going on here? It's doing the exact There we go. Can you guys hear me again? Yes, good? Okay, sorry about that. So what ends up happening with these Van de Graaffs, as I'm talking about lightning and getting shocked, these things build up a ridiculous amount of voltage. Anywhere from 200 to 500,000 volts gets built up in these things. Now, it's so much voltage that it actually can affect electrical systems in other rooms. In fact, when we switch, when Chris switched from our camera shot to our room shot, the reason he did that is because the Van de Graaff actually would cause the camera to start flickering. Now, in our tests, we thought this might happen. What's happening is it's putting out so much voltage that it actually can disrupt the mic. So that's what happened there. Now, coming back to our Van de Graaff, the body is electrical. So every time that volt shocked me, it was actually causing my muscles to flex involuntarily. I didn't really have much of a choice on that. But now that I'm done, with our big lightning machine, I've gotten shocked quite enough, which is why my hair is kind of standing up like that pom-pom was. I'm gonna use what's called the fun fly stick. It's just a small version of the Van de Graaff. Now, what this does is this builds up charge and look at what happens at first. Thanks for panning over here. Look what happens at first. It attracts my metal object here, my little mylar object. But as soon as I can get this little object to fly off, Notice now it's repelling. It's almost like the magic wand here. 
Well, why? Because I built up a certain amount of charge in my fun fly stick, and I gave that same charge to the mylar. It's cool. It causes repulsion. Now, as I've mentioned so far, this has all been dealing with electrostatics, or slower non-moving charges. However, in life, we often see charges move places. Charges go around. Well, just like me moving and walking this stick, here we go. Charges like to travel. <laughs> there we go. Whoop. There we go. Ah, I got stuck. Charges like to travel. And as they like to travel, moving charges create what's called a magnetic field. Now, some of you guys have probably seen magnets before. Those are what are called permanent magnets. Permanent magnets have an internal separation of charge that causes that um, field. We often see these, we, we often see magnetic fields caused by current. Now, when we have magnets, what they do is they either attract or repel one another. But if you get super strong magnets, or you get magnets with a changing magnetic field, what they can produce is what's called eddy currents. In fact, these magnets, what we have here is called a radar magnet. It's a super strong magnet. It, it's actually so strong, it can induce into something non-magnetic, something like aluminum. This is an aluminum board right here. Well, when I swing it, watch what happens. Our little pendulum, well, it swings through. It's probably what you'd expect, right? Why is this so amazing? What's going on here? Well, what I want you to note, and you guys may not be able to see it from the close-up shot, or you may not be able to see it from the room shot, is that this piece of aluminum has a bunch of slits in it. Well, to your right a little bit. Yeah, right there. Right? People can see it there. There we go. Yes. That. Yeah. There are all sorts of slits right here in this piece of aluminum. Well, when we create these eddy currents, falls under what are called Faraday's and Lenz's law, we need to have a repulsion. We need to have one magnet inducing magnetism or magnetic char or a magnetic field in something non-magnetic. But because we have all these little slits, it won't actually induce a solid magnetic field. However, if we replace this blade right here with one that's solid all the way through, now you see we don't have the slits at the bottom. Well, now you'll see something very different is going to happen. And in fact, I trust physics, and I trust physics so much that I'm willing to put my coworker on the line for this. I'm willing to put Don on the line here. Now, as I mentioned, what we should see here is repulsion in this non-magnetic piece. Let's see if we can see it. Are you ready? Let's do it. Face up to there. Here right we here. go. Three, two, one. I heard that, <laughs> that he was a little bit afraid, but physics still works. One more, one more, one more. Physics works? Notice it stops just before it hits his face. Well, what's going on here is, like I said, it is creating a magnetic field in this piece of aluminum in the opposite direction as the magnetic field of our permanent magnet. But notice, even as it swings, it doesn't completely stop. There's a little bit of extra swinging here. There's a little bit of movement still. Why? Well, that's because it doesn't induce a perfect magnetic field. There are always a little bit of losses. In fact, this is the basis behind how, behind how stuff like wireless phone charging works. It also induces a wireless magnetic field in the object around it. But, but it's not quite perfect because our materials aren't perfect. It's really hard to manufacture perfect materials. And what we have right now with respect to ideally perfect magnets, they only work when they are super duper cold or when we really freeze them. And so Don's going to pick up here and talk about start moving this out? Oh, so, yeah, gotcha. I'm going to take that eddy current pendulum out, give it up for uh, Stevie you, Shapiro. You. And we're going to move on, like he said, to this thing, this fantastic, amazing, weird, confusing thing called superconductors. And let's see if we can get the camera over here. Uh, switch the input to black magic on, the, on Zoom. And so what I've got here is liquid nitrogen, nitrogen in the liquid phase. And this stuff is really, really cold. It's somewhere around 73 Kelvin, which is very cold, very, very cold. I think it's negative 200 Celsius or so. Uh, much colder than probably anything you or I will ever encounter after this. Um, uh, 
Uh, and so basically what this can do is super cool these little disks. And so can we see this here? And something really interesting happens when these things are super cooled. And so I'm going to place this on a very strong magnet and you'll see it kind of floats in place. Can we zoom in on that anymore? Yeah. And I didn't leave it in there too long, so it's not particularly strong. But this is a way that we all, oh, we got some new people coming in person, all right. Um, so basically what this does is it is letting the transfer of electrical energy through completely perfectly. And this is that same concept that Steven was talking about, where the, the, that big uh, slab that we were going through the magnet with was, was imperfect. And so it was still moving kind of is in fact locked into place. And you can see it's not just uh, like a north on north magnet, which is like repulsing. It is in fact locked there because I can turn this upside down and it will also stay in place. I can reorient the geometry and will stay in place. And that's because those eddy currents, at least this is the classical way of describing it, those eddy currents are perfectly, uh, are perfect and they are not losing any energy. So I'm gonna do this one more time here. And so this has a lot of implications. I mean, this on its own, what I'm doing here right now is, is really cool, but kind of comes off as a parlor trick, right? Um, but something interesting can be done when we mess around with the geometries of the magnets. And so now we've got these circular magnets. What do you think will happen if I put the superconductor on here? My two students in, in, the, in the room here, what do you think? Will it rotate? What do you think? Absolutely no idea. All right. Well, in science, we do our experiment, right? We, we, we approach one of, the, uh, the, one of the guesses, we call that a hypothesis, and we do the experiment, and we find out what actually happens. And so I'm going to bring this up to the circular magnet, and it is free indeed to rotate. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. There's no other thing that humanity has come up with that can freely rotate in space like this. Usually there's some friction due to an axle, say in a wheel, or uh, some energy loss to heat, right? Let's turn this around. So this is kind of a revolutionary thing. This only was discovered, at least this property was only discovered about a hundred years ago, and we are still figuring out why exactly this works. Um, but we know enough to at least try and scale it up. And so what I've got here to the right is essentially a much bigger version of that circular geometry. And so I want you to think about the future for a second and realize that we can now transport these things essentially frictionless. There is no friction except for the air resistance. Kind of seems like a dream material, right? But if you can tell, even from this short demo of this bigger one, it doesn't quite stay up. And you can see there's all this kind of a fog, this steam coming off of it. And that's because it's actually solidifying the water and the air around it. And when it does that, it loses some heat. It loses some energy, or it, it gains some energy by interacting with the environment. And we need to keep it cold for this thing to stay in effect. And this is one of the limitations. This is one of the limitations of this miracle material. It's something that researchers like Chase in the audience here actively are looking for answers to. It's something that if you are a student or <laughs> maybe I'm even speaking to the professors in the chat here, uh, maybe you could be the one to solve it, right? We're all in this pursuit of science and physics together. And so this is the superconductor. It's a, very, it's a, it's a pioneering problem, honestly. And I always love to show it because even the greatest minds in the world don't know how these work quite yet. So that is the superconductor. Thank you. And then before we do our last demo, which should be coming in hopefully, maybe, um, yeah, cool. Before I do our last demo, I just wanted to thank everyone again. And I'm gonna put this back 
Uh, actually, you can, you can do that there. I want to thank everyone again for, for uh, attending. We had more than 40 participants. That is really awesome. I know yeah, things are crazy, and it's hard to find time to do a lot of things that we used to be able to do. Um, and I just really, really want to thank you for coming, and thank you for um, your support. Now, with this last demonstration here, this is a vat of, of vegetable oil. I'm not gonna tell you why this is special just yet because I'm first gonna tell you about these awesome things called lasers. And if we can hit the lights, I'm gonna do it right here. You can see this, this is a green laser. You can see that on the camera. This is just a very straight line of light. We can do really cool things to light once we understand the properties of electricity and magnetism. An electromagnetic wave is just another way of talking about light. And so this is just a green beam that I'm sending out through space. And what I've got here, you can't see it because it's dark now, but it's this kind of loopy thing. Maybe I can show you like this just by flashing the laser over it. You can kind of loosely see that laser structure. Now, this is a special uh, geometry of material and a type of material that where I can point the laser into one end, like this, and it is actually coming out in a completely different direction. But a lot of that light is coming through. And so this is something called fiber optics. We are basically bouncing the light inside of the geometry over and over and over until it gets to the end. And this is the basis for, <laughs> for uh, like fiber optic internet. This is why we have such great internet in a lot of different places because this signal can get through in a, in a really interesting geometry. But really what I wanna get at is that we can manipulate light in a lot of different ways once we understand those properties of electricity and magnetism. This is what comes after as a consequence. Yeah, let's zoom in on that. And so I'm, I'm put it, putting it in this way. It's coming out 90 degrees with a very strong signal. So the last thing I want to talk about is just one of these ways that we can manipulate light. There's this idea that all, that all materials have this property called an index of refraction. It's how, how light bends when it enters into a material. You might remember being at a restaurant and you're looking at your cup and you put your straw in the cup and the straw looks like it's bending, right? And that's because the light that you're seeing out of the water is coming to you through the air and the light in the water is coming to you through the water and then the air. And this idea that light bends, changes the speed of light, is what we found um, as it goes through the material. It makes that illusion or that, that perception that things are not exactly what they seem. And so I've got this vat. So what does that have to do with this vat of vegetable oil? And so I'm going to turn the lights on just a little more because it seems a little dark on camera. There we go. And so this is just a, a standard 600 milliliter Pyrex beaker. And I'm going to basically put this into this vat of oil. And I chose these two materials because the beaker is made of Pyrex and the vegetable oil and the Pyrex material have the same index of refraction. And something really interesting happens when you have two things of the same index right next to each other. And namely, we'll see at first, and we can go a little down here. Right? You can see the air inside of the beaker, but when I insert it completely, it disappears. And so it's totally completely still in there, but because of the, the index of refraction, we can't perceive the bending of light. And so you can probably only see the, the text there on the side of, on the, side of the uh, beaker. And I'm gonna take it right back out. There it is. And then right back in. And if I angle the text just right, you probably can't see it. <laughs> and for those of you with a keen eye, you might've noticed that I had another beaker in here. Not just one. Oh, but two. And so this is a testament to the observation side of science. Don't always 
See what, uh, seeing is not always believing, and we should do a lot more work than just uh, looking at something once before you know, you think you understand what it's all about. And so this was our last demonstration for today. And um, thank you again so much for coming. I can't wait to read the chat and see what you guys were talking about. Um, please, if you're a student, take care of yourself, study hard. Hope, hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you're inspired to keep studying physics. Um, if you're a professor, keep chugging on. There's lots of students that need your help. Thank you very much to all of our admin and uh, business side of, of our operation here at the physics department. None of this is possible without you. And um, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions in the chat before, uh, before we go? And I'll, I'll switch this back to the... Uh... Take care. You're welcome. We know so much more. I'm happy you know a lot more, 258-818. All right, everyone take a bow, let's, let's do it. <laughs> Sweet. You should do this every year, is that Jane Jackson? That's, that's Jane Jackson. Thanks, Jane. The recording will be available. Um, ulterior motive for this was to uh, use this for the virtual open door that will be premiering on March 1st, so hopefully. You can share this with more people as the weeks and months go by. Yeah, no questions. All right. All right, well, we're going to end it here. Thank you again. Take care, everyone, and happy, uh, happy holidays. <laughs>